History as it happens, April 4th, 2024, the election of 1992. How can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing? Uh, if the question, if you're, maybe I won't get it wrong, are you suggesting that if somebody has means that the national debt doesn't affect them? That's why I've offered a plan to get this economy moving again and to create good jobs. And we must break the cycle of welfare dependency. Uh, I don't have any spin doctors. I don't have any speech writers. Probably shows. <laughs> I make those charts you see on television. Even. That show. It was not some liberal Democrat who declared, read my lips, no new taxes, and then broke his word to cut a seedy back room deal with the big spenders on Capitol Hill. A Republican incumbent, a right-wing insurgent, a Democratic challenger, and a populist newcomer. The 1992 election was the first presidential contest after the Cold War, the first of the era we live in today. And the issues sound familiar, free trade, immigration, the economy, with a bit of scandal to go along with it. Why 1992 Matters, next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from the Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. It matters profoundly, I think, because it's the first election after the end of the Cold War. It's the first election, therefore, of the era that we live in today. And frankly, you can see all of the major issues that we are still debating today, whether it's NAFTA and free trade, whether it's America's role in the world, whether it's welfare, whether it's health care, American civil identity, and who really deserves to be an American, who can be an American. Immigration is key. Thank you. August 1992. A beaming President Bush accepts his party's nomination for a second term. This nomination's not for me alone. It's for the ideas, principles, and values that we stand for. And my job... Four more years may have seemed assured about 16 months earlier. In the shining moment of his political career, speaking to a joint session of Congress after a U.S.-led coalition expelled Saddam Hussein's armies from Kuwait. And as president... I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. Success in the Gulf War sent the president's approval rating soaring to 89 percent, according to Gallup. Scaring away prominent Democrats like Mario Cuomo, who may have challenged him for the White House in 1992. If only they could see what was coming. Actually, the 1990-91 recession officially ended that March. But the effects lingered. The recovery was sluggish. The unemployment rate climbed to 7.8 percent. The federal budget was badly out of balance. And as Sean Wilentz writes in The Age of Reagan, with the outstanding exceptions of the invasion of Panama, the Gulf War, and the reunification of Germany, the Bush administration seemed to have become adept at snatching political defeat out of the jaws of victory. Yet because his president the presidency followed Reagan's Bush faced challenges that would have sorely tested anyone. It had been left to Bush to address two enormous fiscal messes the deficits and the savings and loans. Wilentz goes on to say, ironically, Reagan's legacy battered the presidency of his anointed successor. It was almost as if Reagan had set a trap with his supply side profligacy, presiding over what looked like good times at the bill falling due when he left office. Bush, to be sure, lacked his predecessor's charm. But in areas where Bush carried through on popular policies, Willen says, Reagan and not he got the credit where he carried through on policies that had become unpopular like NAFTA. He, not Reagan, got the blame. And one of the few areas in domestic policy where Bush made a genuine contribution, environmental protection, was an area that Reagan had ignored. At the beginning of January 1992, Bush's popularity rating had fallen to 47 percent, one point lower than his disapproval rating. So let us return to Bush's convention speech in August 1992. It's really amazing to read it today and see how much time he spent talking about the past, about America's great triumphs in the Cold War, which he said liberal Democrats had made more difficult. My opponents say I spend too much time on foreign policy as if it didn't matter that school children once hid under their desk in drills to prepare for nuclear war. I saw the chance to rid our children's dreams of the nuclear nightmare, and I did. Well, as James Carville might have shouted at the Republican incumbent, the economy, stupid. 
Bill Clinton listened to his campaign manager. And yet, just as we have won the Cold War abroad, we are losing the battles for economic opportunity and social justice here at home. Now that we have changed the world, it's time to change America. 1992 was not a two-way race, a populist undercurrent that would carry Donald Trump to the White House a generation later, was in 92, led by Pat Buchanan, who railed against internationalists, free traders, immigrants, and gay people. This campaign is for the working people and the middle class of both parties and of no party, for the establishment that has dominated the Congress for four decades is as ossified and out of touch with the American people as the ruling class in the White House. Buchanan hurt Bush in the GOP primary. In the general election, Bush and Clinton would share the debate stage with a different populist, Texas businessman Ross Perot, who, Willens writes, presented himself as an angry, super competent businessman who was willing to lead the country out of its morass, but only if he was drafted by the American people themselves. The supposedly spontaneous grassroots pro-Perot effort called United We Stand turned out to be no more spontaneous than Perot's earlier ventures. But Perot's folksy twang, his blunt phrases, it's just that simple, was one of his favorite lines, and his stance as an outsider gave a ring of authenticity and captivated millions of alienated Americans who had come to think that nobody in Washington could be trusted. Assuming the familiar American role of the village explainer, the uncorrupted man of common sense, Perot hit Bush especially hard over NAFTA, and to a lesser extent over his failure to balance the federal budget. Now, whose fault is that? Not the Democrats, not the Republicans. Somewhere out there, there's an extraterrestrial that's doing this to us, I guess. <laughs> and everybody says they take responsibility. Somebody somewhere has to take responsibility for this. William Jefferson Clinton emerged from a crowded field of Democrats. Paul Songus, Jerry Brown, Tom Harkin, Bob Kerry. But the Arkansas governor's most dangerous opponent may have been himself, or a better way of putting it would be... His personal life and a media environment increasingly obsessed with scandal. In January of 1992, Bill and Hillary sat down for a 60 Minutes interview in which they were grilled about allegations that Bill had had an affair with a former TV reporter named Jennifer Flowers, Jennifer with a G. And they were asked to describe their marital problems, too, as if all of this mattered. Look, Steve, you go back and listen to what I said. You know, I have acknowledged wrongdoing. I have acknowledged causing pain in my marriage. I have said things to you tonight and to the American people from the beginning that no American politician ever has. I think most Americans who are watching this tonight, they'll know what we're saying. They'll get it. And they'll feel that we have been more candid. And I think what the, the press has to decide is, are we going to engage in a game of gotcha? You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. I'm sitting here because I love him and I respect him and I honor what he's been through and what we've been through together. And, you know, if that's not enough for people, then heck, don't vote for him. Democratic voters who were watching in the wilderness after 12 years of Republican control of the White House forgave or ignored Clinton's personal peccadilloes. He won 44 million votes to Bush's 39 million to Perot's 19 million, a plurality. But in the Electoral College, it was a rout. Clinton, 370, Bush, 168, Perot, zero. Jeremy Surrey is a historian at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of The Impossible Presidency and the host of This Is Democracy podcast. Jeffrey Engel is the founding director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. And he's the author of When the World Seemed New, George H.W. Bush and the End of the Cold War. Jeremy Surrey, hello again. Good to be with you, Martin, as always. And Jeffrey Engel, welcome back, my friend. Always good to talk to you. Jeffrey Engel, why does the election of 1992 still matter? It matters profoundly, I think, because it's the first election after the end of the Cold War. It's the first election, therefore, of the era that we live in today. And frankly, you can see all of the major issues that we are still debating today, whether it's NAFTA and free trade, whether it's America's role in the world, whether it's welfare, whether it's health care. 
American civil identity and who really deserves to be an American, who can be an American. Immigration is key. This is an election where basically you could rewrite the quotes with different names and it would be exactly the same from 2024 to 1992. So I argue that this election basically is the one that sets the template for our contemporary America. I agree 100 percent. And I would just add two things about the 1992 election that I think are so significant. It is the election where uh, Pat Buchanan becomes uh, a major presence. He had already been an important player in the Nixon administration and elsewhere as a right wing enfant terrible. And now he becomes a major presidential candidate and challenges the standard bearer of the Republican Party, George H.W. Bush, and does it effectively in many areas, uh, so much so that the Bush team has to, in some ways, become Buchanan-like in some of its campaign strategies. And I think that's something we might talk about. So the rise of the far right, which had always been there, but I think it's an important moment in the rise of the far right. And then the growing dissatisfaction with mainstream candidates in both parties and the rise of Ross Perot. This largely unknown wealthy businessman from Texas wins almost 20% of the vote, which is really, really high for third party candidates in American history. It's very hard other than Theodore Roosevelt to find many who do as well. Uh, Ross Perot does better than George Wallace, for example. And Perot is not running on white supremacy, on race, in the way that other third party candidates had. Uh, He's expressing dissatisfaction with the mainstream views of international trade, tax and spend policies, uh, Cold War policies by both parties. The border issue is an important issue for him. So the Perot candidacy, I think, represents part of the falling away of consensus behind the two-party system that we've inherited as a problem in our politics ever since. We can see the beginnings of the populism that is now dominant in politics today, at least in the Republican Party. I mean, I think it's a phony kind of populism, but yeah, you can see the inklings of it here. In 92, there's another candidate that I think we need to keep in mind who is David Duke, former Klansman. What was he? What do they call it? The chief wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Grand Uh, wizard. Grand Grand wizard. wizard. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it wrong. My apologies. He, of course, had a failed effort to win statewide office in Louisiana and then runs for the Republican ticket. And what's significant is not so much that Republicans accepted his view of the world, but that he thought there was enough space within the Republican Party for him to put forward that agenda somewhere where he would have been more comfortable, obviously, in the Democratic Party 25 years earlier. So Pat Buchanan does a lot of damage to George H.W. Bush. He also does a lot of damage to David Duke because once David Duke, the documentation on this is great, once David Duke realizes Buchanan's in the race, he says, well, those Basically, those racist nationalists were my constituency. Now I got nothing. Well, and I think there's a really important point in the way the media plays into this discussion that we've already had here, which is that Perot and Buchanan, and to some extent David Duke, but I think David Duke is behind on this. He's playing the old politics of of the 50s and 60s. What Buchanan and Perot realize is that they can make uh, outlandish speeches and they can tell off-color jokes and they can poke fun at candidates and that this becomes entertainment politics in a new way. This is before social media. But what it is, is it's a moment of cable television. And there was a big shift going on when I think through the 1980s, through the second Reagan uh, election, people are still largely getting their information through network news and standard newspapers. By the early 1990s, we're in a cable news environment. And especially where you have news networks that need 24 hours of news coverage, uh, outlandish speeches, saying things and doing things that run against conventional wisdom for the sake of running against conventional wisdom gets attention. It mobilizes mobilizes people, and it becomes entertaining. I remember it was the first election I voted in. I remember sitting with other college students watching the debates. No one liked Perot, but everyone found him entertaining, and that was part of his appeal. It's just that simple. I've got a lot of experience in figuring out how to solve problems, making the solutions work, and then moving on to the next one. I've got a lot of experience in not taking 10 years to solve a 10-minute problem. So if it's time for action, I think I have experience that counts. If there's more time for gridlock and talk and finger pointing, I'm the wrong man. You know, the giant sucking sound at the border. You can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25. Let's assume you've been in business for a long time. You've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor. Have no health care. That's the most expensive single element making a car. Have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement. And you don't care about anything but making money. 
there will be a giant sucking sound going south. I've actually been working on parole for the last couple of years, so I've gotten into his head and he's gotten into my head a little bit. But I would push back a little bit on something that Jeremy said. I'm not entirely sure that Perot didn't believe everything he said. I think that was actually how he viewed the world. And there's this fine line for Perot between being brilliant and being wackadoodle. Since we're dealing with voodoo economics, a great young lady from Louisiana sent me this voodoo stick and I will use it as my pointer tonight. And overly simplistic that runs throughout his entire narrative and that was also his appeal. His appeal was let's use common sense. Every now and then, let's be honest, government is complicated and common sense doesn't actually give you the easiest answer. But his appeal was, let's use common sense. Well, so went back to the Nixon administration, right? He would drive them crazy with the POW MIA stuff. The problem with writing a biography of Ross Perot is it's too long, by definition. For those of you who do not have the pleasure of having children in the public school system of the state of Texas, you should know that much of the Texas curriculum, especially vis-a-vis where athletics fits in, is a direct result of Ross Perot's influence to it better, I think, back in the early 1980s, where he took on that cause of saying, you know, no pass, no play. It was a big Perot idea. So the point is, whether it's POWs, whether it's running for president, whether it's getting hostages out of Iran in the 1979 crisis before the American hostages were taken into the embassy, the book on Perot is endlessly fascinating and long and confusing. So, Jeremy, something that's interesting about this election, with the benefit of hindsight, right, because sometimes looking back on things, it seems like it was inevitable. But at the time, I think this was a surprise, the result, or at least from my vantage point. We're in an era here where it looks like Republicans are going to control the White House forever. Uh, Reagan wins in 80. Reagan wins in a rout in 1984. Walter Mondale wins one state, 49 states to one. 1988, George Bush beats Dukakis. Uh, Not quite as lopsided, but still pretty lopsided. And Dukakis had been ferociously attacked by the Bush campaign, and Dukakis also looked hapless. You may remember the news clip, uh, Jeremy, of Dukakis in the helmet riding in the tank. Sure. I mean, Democrats look like they're in disarray. And here he comes, General Patton, General Abrams. No, Governor Dukakis. Not a boy, Jim. Riding to glory in every little kid's Rambo dream. But then they win in 1992. However, I still think we're operating in the so-called age of Reagan, where the electorate or just the, the political landscape is still tilting more to the right. So what Clinton is able to do is constrained by that. Clinton, the winner, runs as more of a centrist. I know there's a big debate about just how centrist was he. Did he run as a liberal or not? That's factually true, what you just said about the landscape at that time tilting to the right. I think it's the end of that tilt. I think one of the things this election does, we didn't say this before, is it marks the end of that uh, Republican advantage for the White House. After 1992, Republicans will only win the popular vote for the White House two times after that. Every other popular vote will go the way of the Democrats. It doesn't mean the Democrats always take the White House. There are all kinds of stories about that. We could talk about the 2000 election another time. But if you look at 1992, for example, George H.W. Bush wins about 39 million votes and Ross Perot wins about 20 million votes. So that's about 59 million votes there by my higher math. Bill Clinton only had 44 million votes. And if you combine the Bush and Perot votes, and one has to assume that the majority of the Perot votes came from the Republican side of the House, Um, you're almost at 46% and Clinton had 43%. So the point here is that there probably were more right of center voters in that 1992 election than there were left of center voters. Bill Clinton builds a new democratic plurality or majority for the White House thereafter. And he does that as we can talk about later, by taking some of the Republican issues, particularly on welfare reform, crime, and various other issues like that. This election is a surprise for two reasons, because in 1990-91, George H.W. Bush is so popular. Most Democrats, most top Democrats don't want to take him on. That's why Mario Cuomo, governor of New York, for example, doesn't run. Uh, So Bill Clinton from a small state in Arkansas is, is not considered one of the top candidates. He had actually not done well at the Democratic Convention in 1988, giving a terrible speech. Yeah. Uh, but he's able to get in. He's able to get in. And then as the economy sours, and quite frankly, as Ross Perot steals the thunder from George H.W. Bush, those two things together foist uh, Clinton into the White House. And here's an interesting point. Some of the most influential and important presidents in American history 
have actually been the minority presidents, the presidents who actually received far less than 50% of the vote. Think Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, and Bill Clinton. So Jeffrey Engel, let's talk then about the incumbent, President Bush. You, of course, wrote a great history of his presidency. This was the end of history, right? And a moment of triumphalism. Bush in 1990, 1991, sky-high popularity rating because of how he handled the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. That may have obscured the divisions within the Republican Party that would eventually hurt him, as we've been discussing Buchanan. So maybe we should start with George H.W. Bush being a different kind of Republican than Ronald Reagan was. That's probably the best place to start. We are operating in the age of Reagan, the grand political spectrum that Reagan gives us. But Bush is an uncomfortable fit in that to begin with because he is from the increasingly small progressive part, liberal part of the Republican Party, part that's in favor of immigration, the part that's in favor of gun control, et cetera. Therefore, he basically turns himself into a bona fide conservative when he becomes vice president. Bush's mantra was every day that he was vice president was, I don't disagree with the president. And he even said that after he was president-elect, in fact. But he he wasn't really that convincing as a conservative, but go ahead. He he wasn't a conservative. I mean, this is an accurate depiction of the man was not a a conservative-like Reagan was, or like Pat Buchanan, you know, he was a, a Northeast progressive and it happened to come from Houston, but Northeast progressive. <laughs> and that's part of the, that's part of the allure. What was, what was right. the joke that they said? He was the only man who ever ate lobster with his chili, I think was the, the great <laughs> line about that from Jim Wright. He was in the unusual position, therefore, of being the first vice president since Martin Van Buren to win the presidency himself immediately following being vice president. But if you look, take a broader perspective, remember that that would, if he had won re-election in 92, that would have been four Republican victories in a row. And that gets you back to Franklin Roosevelt territory. We rarely see one party win four in a row. So after 12 years of Republican rule, after the Cold War, when the boogeyman of the communist world, or at least of an unstable world, because as you said, the world seemed to be going in America's direction, foreign affairs seem much, much less important than the fact that we are entering, actually in the middle of, a dire recession at this point. Yeah. And Americans are fed up. It's it's remarkable that if you think about the fact that Americans had just won the Gulf War, had just won the Cold War, uh, where the predominant power and people were talking about the new American age and is in America the new Rome, that the vast majority, 75 to 80 percent of Americans at this period in 1992, when asked, is the country going in the right direction, said no. Perhaps we're exhausted from 40 years of Cold War fight and we want something new and more importantly, want something focused on us, on the American people. We should remember, for example, one of the great debates of this period was what to do now that the Cold War was over with hopefully decreased military spending. People refer to it as the peace dividend. The idea being, hey, we no longer have to spend that money overseas. We can spend it on ourselves. And isn't it more fun to spend money on ourselves than on somebody else? So that really gives a sense of how Americans thought about the transitioning world and their own declining personal economic stakes as they perceived it in it. And where George H.W. Bush fit into that because he was – poorly suited, it seemed, to the domestic policy arena, where he often seemed out of touch or aloof versus the foreign policy. policy. He was a foreign policy president. He he wrote in his diary, he obviously couldn't say this out loud, but he wrote in his diary, I just find foreign affairs much, much more interesting. Also, I think, suffered from the fact that he was, to my reading, a remarkably good foreign policy president. And when you're remarkably good at keeping crises from exploding, people don't know it. So I, I love the fact that you called him a Northeastern progressive, Jeff, because I'm going to push back a little bit uh, okay. on that. But far be it for me to question you on, on your friend, George H.W. Bush, and you had become friends with him. So you, you certainly have a, have a personal sense of him that I don't. I met him once or twice, but have none of the privilege you had of getting to know him. And of course, you've read his record closer than anyone else I know. Uh, but it does seem to me that Bush only looks like a Northeastern progressive now, that in fact, he was more in the, in I would say, the frame of an Eisenhower conservative, and the Republican Party had moved to the right, very far to the right of him. And some of that was Reagan, and then some of that was how Reagan was used by people like Pat Buchanan, 
and others. And to me, what's interesting about the 1992 election in this context of your really wonderful explanation, Jeff, is that in some ways, Bush was thinking about the presidency and his job and what he did well in a kind of 1950s Eisenhower frame. And Clinton was the one who, as a campaigner, was a more innovative political thinker. Clinton was the one who was saying, I need to carve out a place for democratic politics that doesn't look like Michael Dukakis liberalism, that doesn't look like Franklin Roosevelt. It's not going to be Massachusetts liberalism. It's not going to be Hyde Park liberalism. It's going to be some kind of Southern mix of both a politics of the welfare state, but a welfare state that's smaller, a welfare state that emphasizes entrepreneurship and capitalism and a smaller government. Growing up in the South, I learned values. Hard work, family, faith, responsibility, concern for others. It's time to restore the dignity of work in America. That's why I've offered a plan to get this economy moving again and to create good jobs. And we must break the cycle of welfare dependency. We need to provide more education and training and child care and medical services. But then we must insist that when people can work, they must work. I want to end welfare as we know it and restore dignity and self-esteem to every American. Uh, and I think that's significant. And I think that's what makes Clinton a unique candidate. He can still get that progressive vote, but he can charge up some people in the middle of the political spectrum. And that will be the later coalition that he builds. And to change candidate at a time when the domestic economy wasn't doing very well. The recession had ended. And I do want to talk a little bit about the state of the country in 1992. And we're getting to it here. But the recovery was poor. It was uh, the so-called jobless recovery. I remember this. The layoffs Big corporations were doing large layoffs. White-collar workers were losing their jobs. And Clinton ran as a change candidate and, as Jeremy said, not your typical New Deal Keynesian big government liberal. He was not friendly to labor unions. Nelson Lichtenstein documents this in his recent book called The Fabulous Failure about the Clinton economy. We have to change in this country. You know, my wife Hillary gave me a book about a year ago in which the author defined insanity as just doing the same old thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We have got to have the courage to change. We have gone from first to 13th in the world in wages in the last 12 years since Mr. Bush and Mr. Reagan have been in. Personal income has dropped while people have worked harder in the last four years. There have been twice as many bankruptcies as new jobs created. We need a new approach. The same old experience is not relevant. We're living in a new world after the Cold War, and what works in this new world is not trickle down, not government for the benefit of the privileged few, not tax and spend, but a commitment to invest in American jobs and American education, controlling American health care costs and bringing the American people together. That is what works. And you can have the right kind of experience and the wrong kind of experience. Mine is rooted in the real lives of real people, and it will bring real results if we have the courage to change. What's interesting is that Clinton runs for free trade. He actually defends free trade, and he's appealing to business leaders. And Nelson Lichtenstein makes the point that this actually happens to come from Clinton's direct connection to the big corporations in Arkansas, one of them being Walmart, of course, right? So he's pro-free trade, but at the same time, he runs anti-Japanese, that he's going to put pressure on the Japanese and others to stop their industrial policies and to force them to import more goods from the United States. And he criticizes Bush for being not really free trade and not tough enough on countries like Japan that are not taking in our imports at the time. And so that becomes an appeal for him to both business leaders who want free trade and workers who feel that the Japanese are taking away their jobs at this time. There's another important element of what Clinton does. And remember how important crime and by extension race were in the 1988 election. 1988 was the Willie Horton election, if you would. And Bill Clinton, again, as a, I think this is important as a Southerner, is able to speak the language of race in a way that makes Southern Democrats who are thinking about becoming Republicans, that's the big transition going on at this period, comfortable. You know, he is tough on crime, tough on welfare, you know, is able to speak the language trying to get Americans in the white majority to feel comfortable with his liberalism and yet also feel that they are going to be safe in the places they don't like to talk about at dinner parties. Clinton is, I think we can all agree, by far one of the most fascinating political characters of our era, maybe the entire 20th century, certainly profoundly flawed, but no one ever doubted his brilliance. You could doubt his self-control, 
but you wouldn't be able to doubt his brilliance and his ability to triangulate his position so that he was essentially between the polar extremes of the electorate within that Reagan spectrum was consistently brilliant. And I want to give an example of what Jeff just described so well. During the campaign, I remember this vividly. Clinton, during the campaign, made it a point of condemning certain black rap, a gangster rap performers, in particular Sister Soldier. She told the Washington Post about a month ago, and I quote, if black people kill black people every day, why not have a week and kill white people? So you're a gang member and you'd normally kill somebody? Why not kill a white person? Last year, she said, you can't call me or any black person anywhere in the world a racist. We don't have the power to do to white people what white people have done to us. And even if we did, we don't have that low down, dirty nature. If there are any good white people, I haven't met them. Where are they? Right here in this room. That's where they are. I know she is a young person, but she has a big influence on a lot of people. It is very shocking to me that in a time of American economic recession and inner city urban chaos, Democratic presidential contender Bill Clinton has chosen to attack not the issues, but a young African woman who is very well educated, alcohol free, drug free, a successful self-employed businesswoman and a community servant. And he, he stood up and condemned her and then went the next day to a black church. And what he was saying basically was, I'm connected to the African-American community, but I'm also going to separate myself and try to separate that community of my voters from what antagonizes what creates fear among white voters. And it was a brilliant way of playing both sides. And it made George H.W. Bush look awkward because George H.W. Bush didn't even know who Sister Soldier was. Remember, during the campaign, Clinton, as governor of Arkansas, was faced with the question of whether or not to um, execute. Yeah, I was thinking about the exact word is he was not going to pardon the person, but he was going to commute the execution sentence, I guess, yeah. of a clearly mentally deficient inmate. And the grounds was it's it's cruel and unusual to execute someone who is mentally deficient. And we know this person was mentally deficient, among other reasons, because when he had his last meal, he saved his dessert for later. And Clinton made a point of saying, I am tough on crime. The law says execute, and I'm going to sign off on the execution. And I think that was a signal, among anything else, that he was going to be as tough as the Republicans on this issue. So at this point, we're starting to see the transition to what you might call our current moment. Uh, there was no solid Republican South yet. Clinton wins Missouri, his home state of Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky, if you consider Kentucky part of the South. Uh, West Virginia, also a red state now. He wins that one as well. He wins California, which had been won by George Bush in 1988 over Dukakis. Imagine that, a Republican winning California. Of course, Ronald Reagan won it twice. But, you know, I, I think why this election is important and is fascinating is because we thought one thing was happening— the end of history. We won, they lost, which then validates our system. Yet, Americans aren't happy with the direction of the country. Bush had to clean up the mess left by his very popular predecessor. Deficits and the SNL crisis. And environmental difficulties and difficulty in people's health care. Again, I can't come back and stress health care enough. This is a good moment where Americans and I'm painting with a hugely broad brush, but I think this helps explain the Ross Perot phenomenon. When Americans look and say, I'm glad we won the Cold War, why am I still personally losing? Or at the very least, why is it so hard? And we have to remember that the 1990s become a booming decade, obviously. And this transition happens very quickly, you know, since this is the era when all three of us sort of first got engaged in politics. I'll tell my own story about this, which is I remember clearly I graduated in 1995. So 1992 was the first campaign that I was on a campus for. But in 1995, one of my close friends, an honor student, I remember we all celebrated, just celebrated when she got a job that paid half benefits. And within three years, the people who were freshmen when we were seniors were fighting off signing bonuses. You know, there was just a remarkable transition. And so the earlier period is what we're talking about, 1992, where there is, as you said, the jobless recovery. And I think there's a, a larger phenomenon here that you're getting at, Jeff, so well, which is that when you win a war, you often lose the election after the war. 
And I think Bush fell into that. So it's not just that the domestic conditions were difficult. They certainly were. I agree with everything you've said. But there is a tendency in democracies to say, okay, you were the war president. Now it's time to deal with the domestic issues. And that's precisely what Clinton ran on. Clinton made the case that he never actually questioned George H.W. Bush as being a good person or being someone who was a leader in his own time. In that sense, this election is very different from ours today. You didn't have candidates calling the other one evil or mentally incapable, things of that sort, right? Instead, Clinton's argument was similar to Kennedy's argument when running in 1960 against Richard Nixon, that the other guy was the old politics, and that history is over, but now there's a new history, and it's time for me. I remember I actually worked on the Clinton campaign. I was in college, too, and it was the first campaign I worked on. I'm revealing too much here. But I remember I was at the convention in New York in 1992, and it was all about actually time to move beyond Bush, right? Not Bush being bad. No one criticized him for how he managed the Persian Gulf War. In fact, most Democrats were happy we weren't fighting in Iraq. Most actually agreed that stopping at the Kuwait border was, was enough, uh, liberating Kuwait. But it was time to move on. He had done his job. We were in a new world now, a new generation. And that's what it felt like. That was the enthusiasm around Clinton. We meet at a special moment in history, you and I. The Cold War is over. Soviet communism has collapsed. And our values, freedom, democracy, individual rights, free enterprise, they have triumphed all around the world. And yet, just as we have won the Cold War abroad, we are losing the battles for economic opportunity and social justice here at home. Yeah, I remember what Paul Sanga said, the Cold War is over, Germany and Japan won. There were major shifts happening, despite it being a boom decade. You're right about that, Jeff Engel. But there were major shifts happening in the nature of globalization, global capitalism. And the generational shift, I think, really yes. can't be underestimated. That one of the key points of separation between Bush and Clinton is, of course, Clinton had a very checkered track record vis-a-vis -vis his military service in Vietnam, which we can get into. Bush, of course, was a war hero, but Bush was a war hero in World War II. And you almost could hear the echo in the background whenever a person supporting Bush would say, this man was a combat veteran. Someone else would echo behind them, do we need another World War II era president? <laughs> you know, isn't it time to move on? Precisely. Well, he was a combat Precisely. pilot. He was called the wimp by Newsweek in 1987. So he thought he had to prove himself as being tough enough. But yeah, because of the end of the Cold War, the fact that Bill Clinton didn't really know anything about foreign policy, had the issue of the draft dodging, the alleged draft dodging, it did not hurt him in 1992 the way it would have if the Cold War was still going on. But I do want to correct something there, Martin, if I might. Okay. I think that's all true, but we have to be careful not to go too far. Here's again how 92 was different from the 2000 election or our most recent elections, in that there was a foreign policy debate in this election. There wasn't a debate about the Gulf War, and there wasn't a debate about the Cold War. But Clinton did go after Bush for not caring enough about human rights. That was the argument he made. Right. Looking at, for instance, Yugoslavia, which was then in the midst of a civil war, a civil war that was horrifying to watch. Here we are close to the center of Europe. Uh, we supposedly believe we're in this post-Cold War era of peace and American hegemony. And we see people being put into concentration camps. There was a Time magazine cover showing that. And news reports on massacres occurring right in Europe's backyard. The Europeans are unable to do anything about it. And the Bush administration seems unable to do anything about it. Now, Clinton was careful. He didn't want to claim that he was going to send American forces into the former Yugoslavia. And he certainly chose not to do that there. He also chose not to do that in Rwanda for which he's been criticized by others. But he made the case as a candidate that we needed a new generation of leaders who weren't driven by geopolitics, but were driven by human rights and other conditions like that. Yeah, a new basis for our foreign policy. Something else Clinton uh, criticized uh, Bush about, and I appreciate you bringing up that point, Jeremy, because it reminded me of this. He criticized Bush for not doing enough to help Haitian immigrants. There were waves of Haitian immigrants coming in the early 1990s. But when Clinton got into office, he decided he had to be tough on immigrants, too. Tiananmen Square remains a topic in the 92 election. That, of course, had occurred in the crackdown Tiananmen Square was June of 1989 at the very start of Bush's first term, only term. But Clinton had the advantage, which, frankly, I think Donald Trump had the advantage of in 2016 and may have again in 2024, of being able to say, I would have done things differently. I would have been tougher. 
without actually having to do anything. Because once Clinton gets into office in 93, he's remarkably nicer to the people that he had referred to as the butchers of Beijing. It's easy to attack your predecessor when there is a, I would consider almost a no-win situation of American response to Tiananmen Square. It's easy to attack whatever the current president had done because you don't have to do it. Governor Clinton, you've accused the president of coddling tyrants, including those in Beijing. As president, how would you exert U.S. power to influence affairs in China? I think our relationships with China are important, and I don't think we want to isolate China. But I think it is a mistake for us to do what this administration did when all those kids went out there carrying the Statue of Liberty and Mr. Bush sent two people in secret to toast the Chinese leaders and basically tell them not to worry about it. They rewarded him by opening negotiations with Iran to transfer nuclear technology. That was their response to that sort of action. Now that voices in the Congress and throughout the country have insisted that we do something about China, look what has happened. China has finally agreed to stop sending us products made with prison labor, not because we coddled them, but because the administration was pushed into doing something about it. So I would be firm. I would say, if you want to continue most favored nations status for your government-owned industries as well as your private ones, observe human rights in the future. Open your society. Recognize the legitimacy of those kids that were carrying the Statue of Liberty. If we can stand up for our economic interests, we ought to be able to pursue the democratic interests of the people in China. And over the long run, they'll be more reliable partners. President Bush, you have one minute. Well, the administration was the first major country to stand up against the abuse in Tiananmen Square. We are the ones that worked out the prison labor deal. We are the ones that have lowered the barrier to products, but Carla Hill's negotiation. I am the one that said, let's keep the MFN because you see China moving towards a free market economy to do what the Congress and Governor Clinton is suggesting. You would isolate and ruin Hong Kong. They are making some progress, not enough for us. We were the first ones to put sanctions on. We still have them on on some things. But the Governor Clinton's philosophy is isolate them. He says don't do it, but the policies he's expounding of putting conditions on MFN and kind of humiliating them is not the way you make the kind of progress we are getting. Buchanan. As you both know, I'm on a one-man mission, doomed to fail, of course, to get people to stop comparing Donald Trump to Nazis and Hitler and all this other stuff. Our problem is in fascism today. It's kind of an illiberal form of American populism or fake populism. But anyway. I was you... afraid you were going to try to sell us Bibles or something there for a second. <laughs> no, uh, I have a pamphlet here, <laughs> Greatest Moments in Jets History, uh, 99 cents. <laughs> I would I would just assume buy that over buying yeah, Trump's Bibles. Yeah, but anyway. Course, sure, but, yeah. <laughs> Buchanan, right? So some of this was there under Reagan, but it was bottled up for a lot of reasons. One, the Cold War was still going on, and it made sense to have what Buchanan would later deride as, you know, too many overseas commitments and bases. You know, he said when he launched his campaign in New Hampshire in late 1991, about two months before the New Hampshire primary of 92. All the institutions of the Cold War, from vast, permanent U.S. armies on foreign soil to old alliances against communist enemies that no longer exist, to billions in foreign aid, must be re-examined. Buchanan exploited uh, the same resentments, the same uh, uneasiness with globalization that Trump would a generation later. New Hampshire primary, and this is a running against an incumbent Republican president, 37 percent. Colorado primary, 30 percent. Maryland primary, 30 percent. Georgia, 35 percent. South Carolina, 25 percent. Florida, 31 percent. These are significant numbers, not enough to win the nomination, but pretty significant. Why was he so popular? So I, I struggle with this because I, I think Buchanan was popular in the sense that he was hitting upon ideas that would become increasingly important, especially within Republican circles. He was a nationalist. He was a nativist. Much of his agenda, by the way, was also against what he called the gay agenda, 
Uh, you know, he did not like the transition of the 20th to the 21st century as he saw coming. He didn't like modernity all that much. Or he would say the liberal society. And he was very clear that all these things were tied in together. But at the same time, at the same time, I don't think 39% of the people in New Hampshire wanted him to be president of Republicans. And I don't think 30% of the people in Colorado. I think we have to remember that at least half of the support for Buchanan is a general frustration boat with George H.W. Bush. Remember, we're talking about the Republican primary and an incumbent president. They're voting to remind the president that they're still there and they're not happy, that they're not happy with his tax policy, they're not happy with his immigration policy, et cetera. So Buchanan has, I think, taps into a certain level of genuine frustration with the establishment. You know, I think the same thing about Robert Kennedy's support today. I think most of the people who support Robert Kennedy have no idea what Robert Kennedy stands for, but they know he's not one of the other two guys. Jeremy, some of that hard right, nasty conservative stuff that Buchanan stood for, that was around during Reagan's time, right? Absolutely. And Reagan was always very good at both gesturing to it and then containing it. I know we talked about this on an earlier episode, and you've talked about it with others. You know, Reagan would play the race card in very intelligent ways. He'd go to places like Neshoba, Mississippi, and he would say he was for states' rights. Uh, But then at the same time, he would sign immigration legislation that broadened the range of people who could come into the country. So he could play both sides and this sort of in the way that Clinton would play both sides uh, on crime. I think Buchanan brought two things together, right? One element of thinking about Buchanan is something similar to what you had with Paul Songus on the left of the Democratic Party. This was a moment when, and I remember this vividly, not just as a historian, but living through it uh, as an 18 year old. It did seem like on a lot of issues, Democrats and Republicans were the same on free trade for example, on crime, they were becoming very much the same. On immigration, right? They seemed very much the same. There was a Fukuyama-like post-Cold War consensus on liberal internationalism. And you had on the left and the right, in Paul Songus and, and Pat Buchanan, you had figures who questioned that, who questioned that conventional wisdom. And their insight was that most people bought into that without actually really knowing why it was supposed to work. And so they were challenging that. And then Buchanan brought something that no one on the left brought at that time, which was then a certain personal charisma which was built around hate and demagoguery. Buchanan loved to find enemies, whether they were welfare queens, as he called them, or illegal immigrants, or what he called tin pot dictators we were supporting overseas, all sorts of things like that he would talk about. And he was able to build it. Yeah, exactly. He was able to bring a lot of excitement around those issues. And if you were someone who was unsatisfied with where the mainstream and the two parties were going, and you were looking for an alternative, a charismatic candidate on the right, Buchanan filled that role. He followed naturally in that sense from Reagan, even though they were very different in their in their substance of what yeah. they believed. Yeah, the Confederacy, uh, I was referring to how Buchanan visited a Confederate monument during the campaign. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Nicky Hemmer reminded me that he also dabbled in Holocaust denial. Well, I, think I think he's more than dabbled. Another uh, echo of today's dilemma, going back to Perot, a couple of things. Uh, As Sean Wilentz wrote in his book, The Age of Reagan, Perot stoked the perception, and he got help from Republicans like Newt Gingrich, stoked the perception that the federal government was dysfunctional and politics as usual were broken. So therefore, someone like him, zero government experience, was able to run the country. And also, uh, well, we talked about a little bit NAFTA. It's not often that a campaign is dominated by an issue like free trade, but this was it. Perot was ultimately wrong. The sucking sound went to China, not to Mexico. But uh, the issue of free trade stuck. And of course, we're still talking about it today. Yeah, and I think Perot was was smart to pick up on that issue. He didn't quite know how to articulate an alternative because he wasn't an isolationist in the way that Pat Buchanan was, but he was also uh, appropriately critical. And and it was something very Texan about uh, Ross Perot then, if I might say that, right? Because Texas is a state filled with corporate bigwigs, and he was one of these corporate bigwigs. But the difference between Texas corporate bigwigs and Northeastern and California corporate bigwigs, in my experience, has always been that the Texas corporate bigwigs wear their nationalism a little more on their Please. It's not that it isn't there with others, but they define their establishment credentials a little more explicitly 
as a nationalism first and global markets second, even though they believe in global markets, whereas it's often the other way around. Those who are California and Northeastern businessmen want to be seen, or business people, want to be seen as internationalists a little more than nationalists. I think Perot played to that. He combined a critique of the conventional wisdom on global free trade with a nationalist argument that we should be caring about our own people. He just didn't blend it with the same kind of xenophobia or explicit xenophobia that was there with Pat Buchanan. Well, it wasn't xenophobia. I think it was it was old fashioned patriotism in in some ways, in the yeah. sense that Perot, I think, represents a type of business person that perhaps doesn't exist anymore. He was obviously wildly successful, made multiple billion dollar companies, and made a lot more money, by the way, when he got bought out from General Motors. But that's a whole other story. He also cared for his employees, and you know, he I think was the kind of person that would say what do you mean fiduciary responsibility? I have to take care of my own people too. So his response in some ways, and I'm putting words in his mouth here, but his response in some ways to the question of NAFTA, if we look at the auto industry, which he he ultimately knew quite well, was if someone said, well, you know, if we don't build cars in NAFTA, the cars are going to cost more. His response would be, so you pay more for a better car, it would be better made, better environmental procedures, by the way, and it will support American workers and will give them the money to buy the cars too. It's a very Henry Fordist in a sense. Yeah. You know, that, the idea that you would simply seek the lowest level did not compute in his sense of what a business person's responsibilities were. If I came to you and said, why don't we do an experiment for five years on NAFTA? Let's let California be Mexico. Let them operate under Mexican rules. Right. Ha, 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 ha. You see what I mean? Everybody say, Ross, that's the dumbest idea in the world. Every factory will be in California. That's what they do say when I say that. I rest my case right there. Money, money is going to chase cheap labor. It was a health care issue. Health care costs for auto workers in the United States was the number one cost of making an automobile. Perot made a couple of mistakes. One, he, he called off his campaign and then came back to it later. I don't remember why he did that. And number two was his vice presidential pick, which maybe in the end wasn't really a big deal. But Admiral Stockdale was not ready for prime time. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> Admiral Stockdale, your opening statement, please, sir. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> I'm not a politician. Everybody knows that. So don't expect me to use the language of the Washington Insider. 37 years in the Navy and only one of them up there in Washington. Let me deal with the Stockdale issue first, if I could. Um, Please. Remember, Perot doesn't really start thinking about getting into the campaign and then doesn't really get into the campaign until 1992 is well underway. And in many of the states that he was trying to get on the ballot for as a third party candidate required a vice presidential person on the ballot as well. He was friends with Admiral Stockdale, who had been, among other things, a remarkable war hero in Vietnam and also a classical scholar from Stanford University. I remember Dennis Miller from Saturday Night Live saying at one point, so the guy's a hero and smart? No, that's not the kind of guy we want in president. (laughs) Um, But they used Stockdale essentially as a a fill-in until he could determine who his real vice president was going to be. And then after a while, it just became, you know, well, I guess he's already there. This is actually something I think is sad for Stockdale's reputation because he is remembered for the single moment of less than competence that he demonstrated in the debate, as opposed to being remembered for the 75 plus years of absolute heroism and brilliance. In in terms of why Perot then left the campaign, that's still a little bit of a confusing issue, but the official story is that he was under the impression that the campaign was about to become very political and personal, and that Republicans in particular were going to attack not only him personally, but his family, and were about to reveal scandalous, not true probably, probably, but scandalous information about his daughter who was about to get married. His argument was, I can't put my family through this. Now, the question that one always should have to ask is, didn't you think about that before you ran for president? 
But this is where you can respond to that question by saying, well, he'd never been a politician before. Yeah, that was his appeal, right? Jeff has forgotten an important thing. Hold on a second. He's forgotten a really, really, and Jeff, I'm surprised you've forgotten about this, really. I mean, he didn't have the insight to think about choosing Aaron Rodgers. Even as a 10-year-old, he could have, he could have, Rodgers was still throwing the football then, apparently, throwing the ball with his father. I mean, if he had chosen Rodgers, he would have been elected, right? You know, I I tell my buddies, I tell my buddies that I don't care what my favorite football players do, except between 1 and 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. But Mr. Rogers has been testing that, yes. <laughs> that tenant. You know, what's, what's funny is if you had said to Ross Perot, well, you know he uses ayahuasca, Ross oh, Perot would have no idea what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, well, you yeah, know, the Jets not. are unveiling new uniform design this month, and their special alternate helmet will be a tinfoil hat. So Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Did George Bush want to be president again? He looked at his watch at a debate. He was asked a question from a woman in the audience. I've played this clip on a recent one of my episodes. Yes. How has the national debt personally affected each of your lives? And if it hasn't, how can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing them? And he gave a defensive terrible answer. Uh, obviously, it has has a lot to do with interest rates. It has... She's saying you personally. You, on a personal basis, how has it affected you? Has it affected you personally? Well, I'm sure it has. I love my grand- grandchildren. I want to think how? that... Th- I want to think, think that they're going to be able to afford an education. I think that that's an important part of being a parent. I, if the question... if you're Maybe I won't get it wrong. Are you suggesting that if somebody has means that the national debt doesn't affect them. Whereas Clinton said, I feel your pain, although he never said those words, but that was a so-called I feel your pain moment. I have seen what's happened in this last four years when in my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. Anyway, he seemed tired and not interested anymore. Did he want to be president again, Jeffrey? He was tired. By the way, you can really peel the onion on these personalities so one of the things that that questioner at the um, town, town hall, town hall, town hall yeah. thank you, town hall debate, when the questioner said, you know, how can you as a person who's never suffered make a point? He kind of took offense to that because he said he immediately followed the fact that he had lost his daughter when she was three to leukemia. So his first reaction was, I've suffered just, you know, because I don't talk about it all the time doesn't mean I haven't suffered. But that's neither here nor there. It is, I think, indisputable. In early 92, the Bush campaign has not set up the proper campaign as they should have. And as all the people around him said that the president needed to, and he dithered. He really dithered on this issue. Now, there's two ways, two overlapping things here. I think the first is, you know, he didn't really know what the future held. He had accomplished the things he wanted to accomplish, and he was tired. And the second thing was, he was tired. And one of the reasons he was tired, and this is amazing, he was suffering from a thyroid condition. And during the early months of 92 is when they were trying to tweak the medicine to get him back to feeling comfortable. I mean, Bush was a high energy human being. He jogged he a lot. Yeah. Repeatedly in his diary that he has this new feeling that he's heard other people talk about, but has never experienced himself, which is fatigue. He is just exhausted. And it also causes, you know, what might cause a little bit of depression. Here's the amazing part, by the way, Barbara Bush, his wife also comes down with a thyroid issue at the same time. Wait for it. There's more. Their dog develops a thyroid issue at the same time. This drove the Secret Service crazy because they said, is somebody poisoning the president? Is there something in the water? It turns out it was the most random coincidence of all coincidences that the three of these individuals, two human, one canine, all develop a thyroid issue at the same time. But you can't understand his lack of energy running for vice for re-election without realizing he was genuinely lacking in energy. I would take a different tack on it, but not in any way differ from what Jeff has said, because I think that's a very persuasive explanation of Bush as a, as a candidate himself. But I think almost all of those around Bush, and I'm sure Jeff has heard the same thing talking to many of those who worked for him, couldn't imagine anyone defeating him. They felt they had done such a good job And they had such disdain for Bill Clinton and the kinds of people around him. And I think that's significant in understanding the attacks on Clinton that would continue 
and that set the stage for the way, quite frankly, Republicans have behaved toward Democrats ever since, right? Um, there was a time, even when Reagan was president, when there was a presumption that both sides were fielding serious candidates and this was a difference over ideas. That's what Reagan would have said. I think Bush saw it that way, but many of the people around Bush thought that he was by far the superior candidate, had a right to rule, had done a good job, and that it was almost an insult that this Arkansas governor, even though he was a Rhodes Scholar, nonetheless, Arkansas governor was challenging them. And they couldn't conceive of Clinton winning in any legitimate way. And even though they didn't claim the election was rigged, they claimed Clinton had played unfair. They claimed that Clinton had been the demagogue to Bush's serious statesman. And then, of course, they blamed, blamed Perot uh, as well. That rubbed off on the Bush campaign, and I think that rubbed off on Bush himself. It took him a long time, in addition to the energy issues, to realize, personal energy issues, to realize that he really had a really tough campaign in front of him and that he had to motivate himself. I think he was more motivated to deal with policy in his last year in office than he was to actually campaign to stay in office. And that's a hard thing for many presidents. I think, by the way, Obama confronted that a little bit in the early months of the Obama-Romney campaign as well. Yeah, timing well, is everything think- in politics. And, you know, at, at that same debate, Clinton talked about, you know, what are you going to do with the economy here, whereas Bush seemed to be out of answers. Clinton didn't really have a great answer either, but he said, trickle down economics. We've been doing it for 12 years. It doesn't work. He was actually right about that. It is because we are in the grip of a failed economic theory. And this decision you're about to make better be about what kind of economic theory you want. Not just people saying, I'm going to go fix it, but what are we going to do? What I think we have to do is invest in American jobs, American education, control American health care costs, and bring the American people together again. George Bush angered conservatives by doing the right thing at the time, breaking his pledge to raise taxes. Breaking his pledge not to raise taxes. Yes. Did I say right? I must have said that wrong. Yeah. So he had said, read my lips, no new taxes. He said that in a few years before that. In 88. In 88. At the Um, the Republican convention in 1988, right? That was his acceptance speech, right? Promising not to raise taxes. But then, you know, reality, reality imposed itself and they needed to raise taxes to raise revenue. Well, I think it's a good example why I think history should and will ultimately treat George H.W. Bush better because he made a campaign pledge. He doesn't deny it. He meant it at the time. And then a year and a half later, he realizes when they show him the numbers that this pledge is not a good idea for the American people. And he changes his mind knowing that he's going to endanger his reelection because he's going to generate enthusiasm from among other people, the Pat Buchanan's of the world. So it's a good example of a president willing to do what he knows is not in his own political best interest because he thinks it's in the best interest of, of the country. I think that's true. I also think he didn't anticipate what Newt Gingrich and others would do, which would be to throw him under the bus. Uh, He believed he'd played, and this is again why 92 is such an interesting moment. It was still believable that we were in an era where politicians would at some level say, we're not going to take the easy road to demagogue an issue. We're actually going to try to work together and solve problems. And he believed he could convince the majority of the Republican caucus to do that. I think he did. The problem was Newt Gingrich and others hijacked that caucus and, and in essence, undermine Bush. Remember, those debates over the budget it took place in 1990 at the same moment that he was trying to deal in the early fall of 1990 with what to do with Saddam Hussein, who had just right. invaded right. Kuwait. And Bush cuts a deal with the Democrats, which included a tax raise, and turned around and discovered that, much like the politics of 2024, his own party wouldn't support him. Yeah. So he winds yeah. up making that deal largely with Democrats because Newt Gingrich, who had said earlier, I will support you, Mr. President, decided that it was better for his own politics not to. Yeah. So what's really remarkable in retrospect about the election of 92 is how little foreign policy and international affairs seem to influence the outcome of the election. As we've been discussing here, it was more about domestic policy, the economy, etc., the recession. And Jeff, we did an episode, I don't know, a year or so ago called New World Order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge, a new era. The new world that George H.W. Bush had hoped to see his whole life that had to be put on hold because of the Cold War after World War II, that he thought he was ushering in by showing what would happen when a tin pot dictator anywhere thought he could bully and swallow up 
a smaller neighbor, right? He said, we're going to replace the law of the jungle with, well, the rules-based order or whatever he said in one of those ring. He wasn't a great orator, but he gave some great speeches during that period, 1990, 1991. A world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle, a world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility for freedom and justice. By the election, that new world that he wanted to see was already out of reach, wasn't going to happen. I think you make this point in your book, that that new world never really was realized. Two points. The first is, I think, Bush's new world order as a political term fell immediately flat because when he described it, people in Washington accurately said, I'm sorry, what's new about that? America leading collective security, a world based on free trade, a world that tries to enhance international law and and et cetera. Bush's ultimate response effectively was, well, this is what we've been trying to do since Franklin Roosevelt. The Cold War got in the way. Now we get to do it. The new part is that we get to implement this. But it didn't sound new. It wasn't a great for a bumper sticker in that sense. The other thing is, I think Bush's approach, and I think this is needs to be appreciated about Bush. He was a glass half full guy, but just barely in the in terms of foreign policy, in the sense of saying he was an optimist, but he never thought we were going to get a full glass. He never thought peace was going to reign. He never thought the conflict was going to go away. His new world order was about setting up the mechanisms for dealing with the future crises. And therefore, by the end of his administration, there are further crises. We have, you know, there's the crisis in Somalia, for example. Bush thought the end of the Cold War gave a new opportunity for the world to work together, but he still thought human beings were flawed and were going to create problems and perhaps not create the best solutions. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right that by the end of his time in office, if you are looking for the actual panacea that Fukuyama suggests, a bad reading of Fukuyama suggests, that's not what Bush was saying, but that's what the rhetoric attached to him. That was the idea behind the end of history, that there had been two competing ways of organizing a society. Communism, command economy had failed. Uh, liberal democracy, market economies had won. Yeah, and, and Bush, Bush writes in his diary repeatedly during this period, and this is when he makes a big move to save NATO as well. He says, I don't know who the next enemy is. I think the enemy is uncertainty. And so we have to be ready. But that's a difficult argument to sell when the country is ready for a peace dividend. And you get people asking, well, what are we doing in places like Somalia? We have no national interest. Fair question. Yeah, go ahead, right. Jeremy. Yeah. I agree with all this. I'm going to just put it a different way. I think in the modern era, you don't get reelected on what you've accomplished. You get reelected on the promise of what you might accomplish or your condemnation of someone else being responsible for what's happened. And so Bush was in a sense running for re-election in 1992 when although there were many issues, on the issues Americans had cared most about for the last, I don't know, let's say 10 to 15 years, actually the country was doing pretty well. Could have done better, but it was actually doing pretty well. Some of that was because of the actions he had taken. Some of that is what he had inherited, and he had inherited problems too. But it wasn't like the country was anywhere near the difficulties of the late 1970s, which you described so well in a prior episode, Martin, or the difficulties of the 1930s, right? The country was actually more secure, even though unemployment was a little higher than what people wanted. Most Americans were actually living better than they had lived 10 to 15 years earlier, certainly if you compare it to the late 1970s, which everyone remembered. So the problem was that Americans felt they were doing okay, and they didn't think Bush had much more to offer them. Clinton was running, and to some extent Perot was running, to say, no, I have something new I can do to move the country forward. That's really what the election was about. People get tired with the successful old guy when the successful old guy just says, I'm going to do more of the same. And that's, in essence, what George H.W. Bush was saying. One of my old poli-sci professors used to say, things get stale after a while. So, yeah, what we get is the Clinton years and what Nelson Lichtenstein describes eventually becomes a neoliberal president and neoliberal economic policies under globalization. Do you agree with, uh, we're jumping ahead here, but I think it's okay to touch on what comes after the election rather than just what happened up to election day. Do you agree with uh, Lichtenstein that uh, ultimately Clinton betrayed liberalism and we get what we now call neoliberalism? 
No, I don't think that's fair. Uh, I've been actually doing a lot of research on this for a new project. Uh, I think Clinton is a brilliant politician who puts together a Chinese menu of uh, different ideas. And one of the ideas he really buys into is that the market works and that the market also avoids difficult political trade-offs. But at the same time that he's doing that, he still believes in a lot of traditional liberal policies. For example, he wants to put more resources into rebuilding cities. He wants to put more resources into infrastructure. He cares about health care. He has a health care plan that he doesn't get through Congress, but he does actually propose one. So, so Clinton is not a neoliberal. I wouldn't say that. I would say Clinton is a mix of a liberal and a free trade conservative. And he's more inconsistent than neoliberals would want him to be. But he's also less of the consistent liberal than old style liberal. Yeah, I've, I've always said that Clinton was the best Democratic president a Republican could ask for. In a fundamental sense, this debate about NAFTA is a debate about whether we will embrace these changes and create the jobs of tomorrow or try to resist these changes, hoping we can preserve the economic structures of yesterday. I tell you, my fellow Americans, that if we learn anything from the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the governments in Eastern Europe, even a totally controlled society cannot resist the winds of change that economics and technology and information flow have imposed in this world of ours. That is not an option. Our only realistic option is to embrace these changes and create the jobs of tomorrow. On the next episodes of History As It Happens. Yes, I said episodes. Next week, we're going to return to the Middle East. We're going to talk about Iraq. And also, who is ISIS-K, the group behind the massacre in Russia? And also, I'd love to hear from you. My email is mdicaro, M-D-I-C-A-R-O, at WashingtonTimes.com. Tell me what you think of the show. Maybe you think the episodes are too long or too short or there's a subject you want me to cover. Also, sign up for my newsletter at HistoryAsItHappens.com or you can find History As It Happens on Substack. Substack.